So I'm the CEO of uh, Logic Bio, and at Logic Bio we have uh, developed uh, a, a platform technology coming out of the lab of Marquette. You may have a chance to, to meet this morning, uh, and we call that a gene editing technology for pediatric disease. So it's here. We became a public company recently, so here are the forward-looking statement. So how do we do that? Uh, we call the platform uh, GeneRide. Uh, and it's a genome editing platform uh, and with which we have already demonstrated in multiple animal disease model a durable treatment with a single injection and single vector. The lead program is for MMA, methylmalonic acidemia. It's a rare organic acidemia, a terrible disease uh, we, we, with a very early onset, so at birth. The platform is uh, very modular and, and applicable to uh, the liver, as you will hear, but also to other tissues, and we have already developed a very interesting uh, concept to develop the pipeline. Uh, we located the, the company in Cambridge to be able to hire talented people, and we have a team of uh, 32 people now. Uh, the company is still pretty young. We started in uh, mid-2016, uh, but uh, all of them have uh, an extensive experience in rare disease and new modalities uh, in terms of drug development. And we, we had a successful IPO in October 2019 where we raised uh, $80 million. So I don't have a lot of, uh, I don't have uh, any pre uh, clinical data to show you, but I will show you, I will tell you a little bit how our product, our technology is different. And so first we do genome editing without nucleases. And on the right hand side on the top, you can see our product. It's an AAV based therapy characterized by the ITR. And in the cassette, you can see the gene in orange. In this case, we are using a gene called MUT, uh, um, coupled with a um, small peptide, a 20 basis peptide called 2A, coming from nature, and flanked by two homology arms. We build these homology arms to target a very specific locus into the genome. They are about 500 to 1,500 base pair. So which gives us a very good uh, specificity. And we harness a naturally occurring process called homologous recombination. So by targeting the, the very end of the albumin locus in the liver, for example, we can insert uh, the 2A and the MUT uh, uh, just uh, before the stop codon without being disruptive to the, the gene uh, albumin. And so we don't need promoters because we, we are taking advantage of the albumin promoter, which is one of the most potent promoters in the, in the body. That's the reason why we, we call the technology gene ride. We take a ride on the gene. And as you can see, at the DNA level, we have the full albumin uh, gene fused with the 2A and, the, and, and then the, the gene of interest uh, just before the stop codon. When we, it's transcribed, we have a very long mRNA which is the mRNA of the albumin, the 2A, and the MUT. And the MUT plays a role at the protein expression level because it does what it's called a ribosomal skipping. With one read, the ribosome can express two distinct uh, proteins, one being the albumin fused with the 2A, and the other one being the albumin of interest. There is one in very interesting feature to this, uh, this step is when the, the albumin, the, um, the protein of choice is not expressed, I mean, it's not, uh, uh, does not circulate into the, into the blood. Uh, you can dose the efficacy of the integration and the expression by dosing the albumin 2A, which, which is a biomarker. So here are some data in, in mice model in MMA. Uh, the, the missing gene is called MUT. And you can see uh, after one month, uh, we have significant uh, improvement of the treated mice on weight, uh, for example, or methylmalonic acid, which is one of the bad acids uh, produced by the disease. But very interestingly, wh what we like to show is after uh, 12 months and, and even beyond, we see what is called a selective advantage. So as you may know, uh, uh, homologous recombination is not a very efficient process. We estimate that we integrate after injection into 0.1 to 1% of the cells, which is, I mean, that's well accepted by everybody. But uh, what we see in some diseases such as MMA, we see that the, the fact that we modify the cells, it gives them a, a selective advantage. And when the, there is a turnover of the liver, 
uh, we, we, we can, you can see on the right hand side that about 25% of the hepatocyte in the liver has been modified after, after uh, one year here. So here is the pipeline. So methylmalonic acidemia is uh, the main, uh, the lead program. We intend to file the IND by the end of this year and to be in the clinic uh, soon after. We have a very active discovery engine process because when uh, we assuming we stay in the liver, we can reuse the same vector, we can reuse the same uh, gene we are going after, and in the liver it's albumin. We can reuse the, the homology arms, so we just have to swap out uh, the old gene and swap in a new gene and we create a new molecule for a new disease. If we would like to go to other tissues, then we will have to change potentially the capsid, definitively the locus uh, uh, on, on which we're going to take a ride on, and, and, and obviously the transgene to express another protein. So I was talking about uh, multiple uh, proof of concept or already done. Uh, three of them has been published in hemophilia B, alpha-1 antitrypsin and Krigel najar But now internally we are focusing a lot on, on these diseases which could give us a selective advantage and could be a game changer in early onset diseases for pediatric patients. Great. Um, thank you for that. So Nuclease-free gene ride platform, um, we know that's automatically different from CRISPR-based uh, systems, which involve nucleases. So when might your approach be advantageous to use? But like the nuclease-mediated uh, editing technology, we can have a very site-specific integration. But we don't face one of the issue of a potential issue of nucleases, which is this off-target integra uh, integration. Nucleases are great molecular scissors, but sometimes they lack a little bit of specificity. And the fact that our homology arms are very long prevent us to integrate in any other locus than the one we have chosen. Great. And so what characteristics of disease indications um, would, let's say, your approach be most useful for? Um, and, and is it really about selective advantage? But what, what's the scope of diseases you could focus on? Well, first, I would say that, obviously, everybody knows that over the last uh, two decades, uh, gene, canonical gene therapy with the epizomal uh, expression has done tremendous progress, and we have product now on the market. Nevertheless, it remains some challenges, and especially in, in pediatric patient population, in, in, and especially when you want to target the liver. You know. We know that episomal expression might not be as durable as what we would like, and, and I think the fact that we can bring uh, some uh, technology which is doing editing, so is providing a, a long, I mean, a durability, in theory, once it's integrating into the genome, it's going to be carried out from one cell to another. And the fact that we are not using a promoter is also, I think, a very uh, uh, good asset for us because, uh, as it has been told this morning, promoter could in, uh, integrate off-target and create some carcinogenicity. So the diseases we are looking at are mainly the diseases where, where you need to intervene before some non uh, um, non-reservable sequelas uh, occurs, and all these early onset diseases which are relatively terrible. Right. So traditional gene therapy, let's say AV-based, uh, has a dilution effect potentially uh, if used in children. So are you saying your MMHR will be in children or in young patients? So we will see uh, where, where we can try, but we are yeah, definitively targeting young patients. Okay, great. And sort of what signals on efficacy are you looking for in that trial? What, what might be good um, based on, what, on your thinking today? So that's going to be the first uh, gene ride uh, trial. So obviously we're going to look at safety, you know, and that's what we need uh, to obviously to confirm. But uh, we will look at some uh, biomarkers which are disease related, such as methylmalonic acid uh, levels. But we will look also um, at uh, this other marker, for example, albumin 2A, which is a very good diagnostic when the protein is, uh, stays uh, intracellular. And obviously, there are some clinical markers, such as growth, protein tolerance, and things like that. That's all the type of markers and, and, and endpoints we will look at during the trial after safety. Great. And 
we know that delivery has been an issue in genetic medicine, so what, what's your approach in terms of vectorology or any other dynamic relevant for delivery? So we have uh, always uh, paid a very special attention to vectors, uh, thanks to the work done at uh, Stanford, obviously. But, and uh, w for now, we are using a, a capsid which is called LK03. And this capsid has been uh, uh, selected in a chimeric mice with a fully humanized uh, uh, liver. So basically, it has been selected for its propensity to target human cells. And we, we think this uh, model is a much better predictor of what's going to happen in humans than, uh, net, um, than a wild-type mice or even a non-human uh, non primate model. This capsid is in the clinic today. It has been used uh, by one company in an hemophilia program. It seems to be a very one of the best capsids in the clinic uh, in terms of transduction. Uh, and uh, the good, uh, good part of the de-risking for us is that the fact it, is, uh, it has already uh, gone to, through the regulatory, preclinical, clinical, and manufacturing steps. But uh, in addition to the work we are doing with Stanford, uh, we have also uh, recently announced a collaboration with a, a site in Australia called CMRI, where we're going to continue to develop with the same type of technology, so chimeric mice, uh, with, for the liver and potentially other tissues, uh, some capsids, uh, and in collaboration with this team. Great. And what challenges do you have to overcome to move outside the target tissue of the liver? You're asking very uh, a lot of questions quickly. <laughs> uh, well, speak more <laughs> slowly. <laughs> okay. So uh, I would say the challenges are, so first we have already demonstrated, and some of them has been published, some early work in other tissues. You know. uh, we don't always need a, a new capsid. We can use what is existing, and, and we just uh, insert our cassette in, inside, inside the capsid. Today, I think we have a very good understanding of the platform and, and all the mechanisms, so we can do by ourselves the, um, um, the initial proof of concept in muscle, CNS, whatever uh, tissue you want to choose. But when it's time to, to go to animal models, I think we will need to acquire uh, this new part of the biology, as we did for the liver. We will need to acquire it for other tissues. And that's something we could do by ourselves or potentially with uh, strategic partners who have already this knowledge. Great. I think event studies would show uh, performance of gene editing companies um, around partnership announcements with bigger cap players. Can, can you talk about what you've previously said about the potential for partnerships with bigger cap companies? I think I've said only good things about potential big cap companies. But uh, no, I think last year uh, we, were, we had a strong focus on developing the company, growing the team, doing the IPO. Uh, this year is definitively a year where we are uh, focusing on partnership, and, um, and I hope we will be able to announce a partnership uh, soon. Great. And so, hidden value. Um, in all your conversations with investors, what, what do you think the market is most missing? What, what is it you have to explain time and again? So first, there are many investors uh, which are not missing anything because they have been very supportive you know, during the private uh, part of the I mean, life of the company and then uh, public life. Uh, but I think, I mean, it's clear now that uh, investors believe that it's prime time for canonical gene therapy. There are some products on the market. A lot of the technology has been relatively de-risked. Uh, I believe that uh, I would like uh, the, the, the investors to realize that this type of technology, which is harnessing a, a naturally occurring process, which at least uh, in, in, uh, in our hands is demonstrating a very good safety, is not for after tomorrow, but definitively for tomorrow. And that's what we, we intend to, um, to um, demonstrate when we're going to be in the clinic uh, by next year. Great. Thank you very much. Fred. Thank you. Of Logic Bio. Thank you.